Hello and welcome back to our apologetics series. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the Eastern Orthodox churches again, uh, how our knowledge of them can help us to explain the historic Christian faith to our Protestant evangelical brothers and sisters, uh, but also to talk about some of the other differences uh, between Catholics and Orthodox. But let us first begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. From the Gospel of John, chapter 17. I pray not only for them, that is the apostles, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, so that they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, so um, last weekend I preached about the Eastern Orthodox Church, uh, its history, um, and what it is, but also by coming to understand them, we come to understand ourselves because we have a shared history. We were one church. We were completely united with them, uh, the first millennium of Christianity. And then sadly, 1054, you have the Great Schism. And so while we're pretty much essentially the same thing, uh, we'll talk about those differences in a minute, um, nonetheless, we're split. So I want to flesh out uh, some of these issues a bit more. Um, because for apologetics, for being able to speak with our non-Catholic uh, Christian friends, and you know, like ninety-nine percent of those will be you know Protestant, Protestants and Evangelicals, not uh, necessarily Orthodox in this part of the world. They're very few, uh, but nonetheless, uh, we can really come to um, a deeper understanding uh, and help them come to understanding. All right, what was Christianity like at the beginning? What did Christ establish? What did the apostles establish, etc. All right, so um, I mean, the honest truth is, is that our Protestant evangelical uh, brothers and sisters are simply not used to dialoguing with the Orthodox. Um, they're used to dialoguing with Catholics, you know, uh, kind of saying why the idea of the Pope is not biblical or whatever the case may be, but they're not used to dealing with Orthodox. And um, I think that that can be very helpful. Uh, if we know a little bit about the Orthodox, it can help us uh, to explain to them historic Christianity. Um, so, you know, uh, Protestantism came out of uh, Luther's battle with the Pope. And so I guess, you know, from their perspective, there's a sense that um, there was one corrupting uh, influence, and that was, that was the Pope. And, uh, and so he was the big problem. Uh, but the thing is, uh, a great number of the, the apostolic churches weren't even under the Pope, um, you know, at the time of Luther. I mean, you got the Iraqis, the Ethiopians, the, those in India, uh, etc. Um, and so the thing is, I mean, the Orthodox wouldn't recognize the full authority of the Pope either. Uh, but yet, they are so much like Catholics. The same structure, the same belief, the same uh, divine worship. Uh, so... At any rate, you take, um, I don't know, I guess my point is they're just not used to dialoguing with, with Orthodox, and actually a lot of them end up becoming Orthodox. You know, they still, they may perhaps grow up with this anti-Catholic uh, sentiment, um, but they come to read about the early church, the early church fathers, what did it look like across the globe? They realize, wow, uh, it actually doesn't really look very Protestant or evangelical. It looked very sacramental, hierarchical. Uh, etc. And so if they still had that anti-Catholic bias, they still had another option, that is the Eastern Orthodox. So you get a, a number of Protestants who end up uh, becoming uh, Orthodox. All right, here's something to keep in mind. All right, so from the Protestant, Protestant perspective, all right, Christianity got started, it was fine, uh, but then it got corrupted, okay? And it needed to be reformed, hence Reformation, the Protestant Reformation. So when do they think that that actually happened? Usually, uh, they will point to the legalization of Christianity in 313. And for Constantine, they would argue uh, paganized uh, the pure Christian church. Um, now, if they're steeped in history, uh, they will recognize, they'll be forced to recognize that 
even prior to the legalization of Christianity and Constantine even being alive, uh, you read the early church fathers and they sound very, very Catholic. It's not like they were, you know, Bible, you know, uh, Bible Christians, Baptists up until 313 and then like a light switch, uh, they, they got turned into this pagan Catholic thing. Um, but that's, that's one of their arguments. And so I guess my, my, my question to that would be, um, well, first of all, it's just not true. You look at you, Ignatius of Antioch, for instance, a direct disciple of the apostles, dead by 107, seven of his letters survived to us. I mean, the church that he had sounded very, very Catholic. Bishop, priest, deacons, hierarchical, you obeyed the bishop, you obeyed the priest. Uh, you had definitely the Eucharist. They definitely believed that Jesus is real presence uh, in the Eucharist. They believed in the, the Eucharist as a sacrifice, etc. So the, it's very, very Catholic, well before Constantine. But let's just say for the sake of argument, okay, Constantine paganized the church. All right, well, Constantine was only, he was the uh, emperor of the Roman Empire, okay? The Roman Empire, uh, for as vast as it was, it didn't cover everywhere uh, where Christianity was. I mean, Ethiopia, for instance, and India. Um, and then, I'm not quite sure how far deep into the Middle East uh, was the Roman Empire at the time of Constantine, um, but I don't think it was as deep into Iraq, uh, for instance, as the Chaldean Christians were. So my point is, is that you had Christians outside of the Roman Empire, uh, yet, um, yeah, so they were apart from any sort of corrupting influence of, of Constantine. But you just, you don't hear, you don't see any letters of any sort of turmoil between Christians about, hey, why are you being paid, why are you allowing this paganization into pure Christianity? There's not a fight. Everybody believed the same thing. And they believed it much earlier than Constantine and the legalization of Christianity. Um, the Christian churches looked and sounded Catholic slash Orthodox uh, to the very beginning. Okay. And so... Um, Here's the big, here's a big argument. Um, I think one of the strongest arguments that we have. Um, and it's, you know, again, the, the, the Protestant reformers, they were battling, you know, Catholics. They were deep in the West. They were in, in Germany and France and Switzerland. Uh, and so, you know, their idea of a corrupt Christianity was simply Catholicism. But our strongest argument, I think, um, when it comes to discussing with non-Catholic Christians, uh, what did the early church look like? What did Christ intend uh, for his church to be and to look like and to believe and to worship, etc., is the fact that um, all of the churches that go back to the first century, they believed the same thing. They were structured the same way. They worshiped the same way. Okay, so by the, by the year 100, uh, during the apostolic period, the apostles or their close collaborators, having established churches as far west as Spain and as far east as India. Uh, but, you know, of course, Jerusalem, Palestine, Syria, Iraq, Egypt, Carthage, um, Armenia, Turkey, Greece, Rome, uh, all these places, they were established in Ethiopia. Uh, they were founded either by apostles or people they worked closely with. And all of these churches sounded the same, looked the same. They all had the same structure. You had a bishop who was assisted by priests and deacons. There was a hierarchy. There was authority. They believed in authoritative councils. Um, they believed in appealing to the Bishop of Rome for a final say. They also, they, they believed the same thing. They all believed in the Apostles' Creed. All of these churches gathered at the Council of Nicaea in 325, uh, and they all embraced the Nicene Creed. They believed the same thing, and they all had the same worship. Uh, so that you, so the um, both East and West, it was the Mass, and very similar structure, even though it ends up kind of looking a little bit different, especially between the East and the, and the West, but the same structure is very much there. So I guess my point is, how is it 
that all of these churches that were founded in the apostolic period, founded by apostles, or their close collaborators, how could all of them have gotten so much wrong? And really, it would take an Augustinian monk like Martin Luther or some of the other reformers 1,500 years after the fact, finally, they come on, uh, they come to, into this world and they are able to give us what pure Christianity was the whole time. I just don't buy it, like at all. All these churches looked and sounded Catholic slash Orthodox back to the very beginning, to the first century. How could all of them have gotten the structure of the church wrong? A bishop with authority, assisted by priests and deacons. How could they have gotten the Eucharist wrong? That Jesus was truly present in there? Or that the Eucharist was a sacrifice? How could they get that wrong? Or the, uh, the idea of praying uh, to saints. The idea of honoring relics. The idea of having altars and churches and blessed objects. The idea of having a liturgical calendar. All these things. Um, having seven sacraments. How could they have gotten that wrong? You know, the Protestants will say there are only two sacraments. Well, it depends on the, the, de the denomination, but I think a lot of them just believe in two. Baptism, um, and maybe Eucharist, maybe marriage, probably the Eucharist. Um, but they don't, they think it's either symbolic or bread is still there. Jesus is only there during the service. Then he leaves after the service. It's, it's just not what we believe. Um, how could they have gotten that wrong? And how could all of those churches have gotten scripture wrong as well? In other words, all, both Catholics and Orthodox, we have those seven books of the Old Testament that the Protestants do not. Okay, so the Deuterocanonical or what they call the Apocrypha. Okay, so first and second Maccabees, Baruch, Judith, uh, Wisdom, Sirach, I don't know if that's seven or not. Um, all of us believed in those books and use them. You know, the book of Sirach is also called Ecclesiasticus, which literally means the church one, the church book, because it, behind the Psalms, it was the most frequently quoted book uh, throughout the church, both the East and West. Uh, how could they have gotten that so wrong? So I, that's the argument, I think, from history. And the more that we know our, our church history, especially the early church history, especially Orthodox church history, you know, we'll notice that all the churches were very much the same. And they were very Catholic slash Orthodox. All right. So, um, what was my note here? Uh, all right. So, yeah, if the Protestants, then, if the Reformers came around 1,500 years later, um, and they basically said, all right, we've been reading Scripture wrong this entire time. And so they came with a correct interpretation of scripture, you know, just scripture alone, no tradition, no nothing else, just scripture. What does it say? Well, why is it that if you come with that approach, you know, scripture alone, why is it that the Protestants have split that many times? There are like 40,000 Protestant denominations. Why is there any more than one? <laughs> if, it, if it's so clear, scripture is clear. Um, and if it's self-evident, you know, why do you have so many Protestant denominations? Like, that's not good. You, you heard the words of our Lord. I began with the prayer, praying just hours before his arrest that his followers be one. Uh, so at any rate, all right, I wanted to get that off my chest because I do think it's a very powerful argument. Uh, but let's transition now over to, uh, the things that do separate us from the Orthodox. Again, I mentioned the big one, my homily, that is, what exactly is the authority of the Pope? Um, is his supremacy simply over the other bishops? That is, is it sim simply honorary? Um, what does it mean? And so, of course, it, it boils down to jurisdiction. Does the Pope have universal jurisdiction, or is he limited to either Rome or the West, something like that? And the Orthodox would say he's limited that he doesn't have authority over other bishops. Whereas we would argue, well, yeah, he does have universal jurisdiction. He could go into any other church and fire the bishop um, if he wanted to. Of course, that very rarely happens, and if so, only in the, in the West, pretty much. 
Um, but uh, nonetheless, does he have that authority or not? And so that's where the impasse is. But there are, there are a few other things. Um, so let's just talk about them. One is, uh, okay, priestly celibacy. Um, again, it's, I don't want to downplay it. It is technically a discipline, but meaning it's a practice, sort of like um, Catholics were required to abstain from meat every Friday before 1967. Don't get me started on that issue. But then that got, that discipline got relaxed. Okay, so there's a discipline, it's like what we do, or the fasting. Uh, how, how long do you have to fast before receiving Holy Communion? Is it one hour? Is it three hours? Is it midnight? Perhaps some of you have experienced all three of those uh, in your lifetime, because I believe it changed during the time of Pius XII. Um, but uh, as opposed to, it's not like we can ever dispense from the commandments. Like, oh, well, we're no longer going to pay attention to commandments four and seven or something. Uh, or we're only going to believe in two people, the Blessed Trinity, something like that. So there's dogma and then there's discipline. And so while most technically speaking, priestly celibacy is a discipline, we cannot downplay it. Uh, the thing is, the early councils of the church refer to priestly celibacy as something, a practice, a discipline that went back to the apostolic period. All right, so it's not a medieval invention uh, by any means. It does go back to the apostolic period. Um, and, you know, of course, the big difference is, now, did you have married priests in the early church? Yeah, you did. But they had to live as brother and sister with their, with their wife. They couldn't live uh, as if they were married, enjoying um, the right to go with that. So they had to be continent. Uh, and so uh, that's the big thing people forget about. Um, so in the late 600s, uh, the Eastern Church, so part of what today would be the Orthodox Church, uh, they started relaxing that discipline. So they would not only ordain married men, but uh, they were permitted to uh, live as husband and wife um, and to enjoy the, the rights that come with that. Okay, so uh, the Church was unified East and West the first 650 years on priestly celibacy, but then uh, they, in the East, relaxed that, okay? Um, their bishops never were allowed to do that, so that's something we hold in common, so bishops, both East and West, are absolutely celibate. Um, okay. Um, Going back to the issue of stripping the Pope of his, what we would say, rightful authority, universal jurisdiction, um, what keeps the, all right, that's what keeps us Catholics together. By you, you have um, you have a final say. You have Peter who has a whistle, who's able to blow it and give a, a, a teaching on something. He's able to settle an issue, for instance, of um, circumcision. Do you have to be circumcised or not to be saved? Um, he dealt with that. It's the issue is passed and the church moves on. You have to have that final referee. And so that's what keeps us uh, Catholics united because the Pope um, is the ultimate source of authority and he blows the whistle. Now, the Orthodox uh, don't see him as having that much authority. And what holds them together to the extent that they are held together and they're not as unified as, you know, we Catholics as a unit are unified, but nonetheless, um, they, they do share a certain amount of unity because they're always like excommunicating each other and stuff like that. They're, they're always fighting <laughs> with each other. Um, but uh, they are bound to tradition, capital T tradition, and they have a very high regard for uh, tradition. So to the extent that they are united, that's because they are united to with their own past, okay, and to their tradition. But the thing is, because they don't have a centralized authority that's binding on everybody, because each bishop is his own fief, as it were, in his fiefdom, um, and new issues come up, there's a lot of, uh, let's not talk about that. Or there's a lot of inconsistency in their teachings. Uh, and so it becomes a battle of opinions 
as opposed to, all right, it's very clear that so-and-so has the final whistle and the issue is settled. So when you strip the Pope of that authority, then that's going to hurt unity. And so you, you see that. So for instance, another issue that we uh, disagree with them upon is um, about is contraception. Now, it used to be that we were completely united. In fact, on the issue of contraception, all Christians were united on it. And yes, there was, you know, prophylactics going back, you know, many, many, many centuries, even to the early centuries, um, the issues of like sheep intestines and whatnot. Uh, so uh, it wasn't a new issue, the idea of uh, contraception, but uh, every Christian group thought it, thought it to be morally grave, um, wrong. Until uh, 1930, the Anglicans in their Lambeth conference said, well, in some cases within marriage, contraception is okay. Even though 10 years before 1920, at that same conference, the Anglicans, they had absolutely condemned contraception. 10 years passed, and magically, something that was immoral sometimes is moral. And the Orthodox uh, kind of did something similar. So in 1937, they um, were pretty strict on, on contraception, if I'm not mistaken. But then later on, uh, those rulings got weaker and, and weaker. And so you have a good chunk of them. The majority opinion would say, oh, well, if your like, spiritual director says it's okay, if it's within marriage, if it's with whatever, then uh, there's certain times that it's moral. And we would say, hey, that's inconsistent with the past. Whereas we, you know, um, you know, the uh, artificial contraceptive pill was uh, a big thing and it was a new way of contraception. It wasn't a barrier. It was forcing sterility on a woman uh, or at least temporary st uh, sterility. Uh, and so that became a new question. What do you do with that? Um, now, we Catholics, we have a pope. And in, in July of 1968, Paul VI, Pope Paul VI, uh, gave his Humanae Vitae. Uh, which he retained the traditional teaching on contraception and said, yeah, this is definitely part of it. And he settled the issue. Now, with that said, you had a lot of Catholics just either ignore or condemn or ridicule or whatever. So that's a whole other issue, whether or not Catholics want to be obedient. But at least the teaching is clear that artificial contraception is gravely immoral and it's never uh, morally licit. Uh, that's where you have natural family planning to space births if you have a good reason remember i mean and people I, this one obviously hits close to home with people but um the first commandment god ever gave was be fruitful multiply not uh replace and uh so at any rate that that's that's a serious topic so contraception it honestly depends where you are in the orthodox world what type of answer you're going to get but that's what happens when you don't have that centralized uh authority. The Orthodox do allow divorce. Okay, now we're not talking about annulments. Okay, annulment is not a divorce. Um, annulment is the root of the word. Null is a declaration of nullity, saying that there was something defective uh, the day of the wedding. Um, so either somebody was coerced, and so they, they weren't able to go there on their free, uh, by the free will to make it a true gift of self. Okay, that can nullify. Uh, or let's say they got married outside of the church on a beach without any sort of dispensation, like if there's no, if, because we're bound to form as Catholics. Um, and so if you don't follow that form, it's invalid. Um, and there are other things like not being open to kids or having no intention of being, it being an exclusive relationship, whatever. So these things that attack the essence of marriage, um, if, if those were, um, if you can find some defect at the at the date of the wedding, then you can make an argument that, well, it's null and void, the contract, the, the covenant uh, between the two. So it's not a divorce. A divorce acknowledged, hey, it, it was a valid wedding, marriage. But they're going not only to separate, you, of course, you know, validly married Catholics can separate, especially if there's abuse, something like that. The issue is being able to marry somebody else. You know, there is a sacramental bond until death do you part, we say, at a wedding. Okay, and so the issue is once separated um, and civilly divorced, are you able to marry somebody else? Okay, we would argue that the Lord was crystal clear on this. 
he who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. All right, and uh, if you want more on that, go to uh, Gospel of Matthew Bible Study, uh, chapter 19. The Lord definitely addresses that um, in earlier as well. I want to say chapter 5, but I feel like it's a little bit later. All right, but the Orthodox um, would say you can get divorced up to three times. Not two, not four, but three. Where did they get that from? I don't know. Um, so that, that is another difference. Um, I guess, you know, we would argue, look, the Lord was clear on his teaching. We have to be faithful to the Lord on his teaching. Um, you, you know, t- the Eastern Orthodox were always very, very close to the civil leader. All right. Remember Constantine, the emperor moved from Rome to Byzantium, Constantinople. And so there's always a very, very close relationship between the emperor or whatever king and the patriarch or bishops, um, you know, whatever, the Orthodox Church. And so it's what you call Caesaropapism. Um, It's sort of this idea of the head of state and the head of the church being very close and being able to, the head of the church being influenced heavily by the state. So, you know, I I mentioned in Russia today, they're building hundreds and hundreds of Orthodox churches and the government over there is paying for it and the government supporting the church very much. But the question is, how much pressure is the church under from the state? I don't know, but it just shows. And yet another example of that very close relationship between church and state over in the Eastern Orthodox. And so... On the issue of divorce, I'm pretty sure it had something to do with an emperor, empress, I think it was an empress, uh, who very much needed a divorce and probably to forge whatever um, you call it, alliance or something. I don't, I forget. Um, so that's another major issue. And then the last one I will mention, it seems kind of small, but it definitely comes up, is what's called the filioque. That means and by the son, okay? So it's in the Nicene Creed, we say that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, okay? When talking about the procession of the Holy Spirit in the Creed. Originally, in the Nicene Creed, well, Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed, so it was really put together at the Council of Nicaea in 325 and the Council of Constantinople in 381 or 3, I forget. And so Council of Constantinople talked more about the Holy Spirit. Council of Nicaea talked about uh, our Lord Jesus. And originally, so that Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed did not have and the Son. So, so the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. Okay, just didn't mention the Son there. Now, uh, as uh, the Church came to a deeper understanding of the Trinity, the workings, uh, the inner workings between the divine persons, the processions, uh, procession of the Holy Tr- of the um, Holy Spirit. Um, they came to understand well; it's really by the Father and the Son. So theologically, it makes sense that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. But the and the Son wasn't in the Creed as written in Greek. So in the eleventh century, in the uh, in thou- uh, in ten fourteen, I think. Um, Pope Benedict uh, the Eighth, I want to say, he simply, by his own initiative, introduced it into the creed and had it sung at Mass in Rome, and, and it spread from there. And so the Orthodox would look at that saying, hey, the Pope just inserted a phrase into the creed. He doesn't have the authority to do that. So they get very, very upset about that um, because they hold councils as the highest rank of authority, not the Pope. And the, the Pope is violating the council by introducing clauses into the creed. Even though theologically, I don't think we disagree, but it, it was the act of what the Pope did, apart from a council, that gets them upset. All right. So uh, I'm sure we could talk a lot more, a lot deeper, but the, those are the basic things, what the differences between Catholics and Orthodox, but also that you um, uh, the, I don't even know how you call it, just I think one of the strongest arguments we can have for non-Catholic Christians to say, look, this is how Jesus established the church. Look at how his apostles and their collaborators established churches all across the globe the first century. 
how they all believe the same belief, how they're all structured the same way with hierarchy, etc. The seven sacraments, they all worship God the same way by the Mass, the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist, and it being a sacrifice, etc. So um, I'm going to go with those apostolic churches that all believed and, and worship the same way, as opposed to a handful of very smart men in the 1500s who said, essentially, I think all y'all been getting it, doing it wrong. You've got it all wrong for 1,500 years, and I'm going to show you the correct interpretation of Scripture. I think that just is such a weak argument on, on their side and such a strong argument simply from history. All right, we're going to end it there. So um, let's continue to pray for Christianity, unity um, amongst all churches. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless.